From dancing queens to spider walking, some of the most terrifying horror scenes look completely different without special effects. The undeniable creepiness of the titular life-size doll in 2023's Megan largely comes from the character's unsettling appearance of seeming almost real but not quite. To achieve this, filmmakers approached the doll's performance as a combination of live actor Amy Donald on set combined with animators in post-production. Donald wore a wig cap during filming. Then later, the digital artist superimposed Megan's face and hair onto Donald's head, creating a character who moved like a real person but was visibly and obviously not human. Speaking about the movie in a promotional video, producer Jason Blum said, I was really impressed with Amy's performance, especially because she was able to do most of the stunts on her own. Director Gerard Johnstone echoed Blum's statement, saying, She could run on all fours really quickly. She could rise like a cobra without using her hands. Like many other iconic horror movie villains, the Megan character perhaps could have been created entirely with visual effects. The fact that filmmakers took a different, more practical path makes her place in movie history all the more memorable. Would Margaret Hamilton have channeled the Wicked Witch of the West signature cackle in The Wizard of Oz if she wasn't painted green and wearing a pointed hat? Would Ray Fiennes have commanded scenes as Lord Voldemort if he didn't sport head prosthetics and wear flowing robes? In many cases, iconic makeup and costuming aren't just what we remember about a character. These elements help the actor inhabit the character to begin with. Taking these tools away poses a challenge, an acting exercise of sorts. Without the costume, without the makeup, is the character still there? Can the actor embody the personality all on their own? While much of Bill Skarsgård's performance as Pennywise the Clown in 2019's It Chapter 2 was achieved with practical makeup, director Andy Muschietti's plan for the film included Skarsgård performing a motion capture test as the character prior to production commencing. This essentially distilled the character solely to Skarsgård's acting, though the footage of him performing this screen test looks decidedly less creepy than Pennywise's actual appearance in the movie. Skarsgård's menacing smile, and therefore the spirit of Pennywise himself, remains present. Skarsgar said afterward that he was initially unsure of how effective his motion capture acting would be, but that Pennywise is ever present and exploded out of me. I was surprised at how much of him was still there. Great. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Creating a film requires artists of many trades and talents working together. The finished product as the audience perceives it wouldn't be what it is without the unique contribution of each individual department. Despite an actor's chilling performance as a horror icon, or the composer who provides the eerie music, or even the costume designer that brings the right threads. It's often makeup artists who help make cinema's most terrifying antagonists shine. Such was the case when makeup department head Eleanor Sabadakia transformed actor Bonnie Ahrens into the horrifying demon known as Valak in 2018's The Nun. In a home video supplemental feature, Sabadukia described Aaron's makeup design as being paler and employing a gradation of grays, in contrast to how Aaron's appeared at the beginning of each day's lengthy makeup application. A nun's wardrobe is universally recognizable enough to not necessarily need makeup to identify the central character. All the same, the makeup's presence elevates the villain's visual appearance to be something more. An oversized jack-in-the-box serves as one of the most frightening and sinister figures in 2015's Krampus. Three artists brought the terrifying toy to life from within a multifaceted costume. Stunt performer Brett Beatty maneuvered the figure's head, puppeteer Imogen Stone the torso, and puppeteer Tanya Drury the tail. When it came time to film the stunt in which the clown toy violently cannonballs through the air, Beatty was the sole performer inside the clown suit. Furthermore, outside wasn't outside at all. The set existed within the more controlled environment of an indoor soundstage. Stunt coordinator Rodney Cook helped build a ratchet to pull the jack-in-the-box out the window quickly. Cook had his work cut out for him. As he explained in a bonus clip posted to Universal's YouTube channel, he said, We're pulling something that's floppy. It's really long and it's a jack-in-the-box kind of thing. We had to get the torso through, get the tail through, and also get another body flying on top of it through. What comes across as a fun and calamitous moment in the movie is actually intricate science and math at work. <laughs> That's my job. With the technical finesse demonstrated by digital artists in the modern era, audiences enter a film with high expectations for visual effects. Benchmarks include Davy Jones' squid-like face in Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Man's Chest and the sweeping vistas of Pandora and Avatar. So we've seen what's possible in terms of elite, believable computer-generated effects, and perhaps unfairly hold everything to those standards. Going hand-in-hand -hand with this principle is the assumption that all special effects are digital. If anything on screen could not exist in real life, it must have been created through the use of computer tools. Why wouldn't it be? These natural, if baseless, preconceived notions about filmmaking are debunked by the perhaps surprising amount of practical effects that artists still use. In watching 2010's A Nightmare on Elm Street, the audience might assume actor Jackie Earl Haley performed his role of Freddy Krueger makeupless, with motion capture dots covering his face to aid animators in monsterizing him in post-production. While Haley wore a few small patches of green screen-esque fabric for the purposes of visual effects, 
and the film does contain its share of digital enhancements, Kruger's facial appearance was largely the work of talented makeup artists, led by makeup department head Karen Lynn. What you see on screen is what the crew saw on set. The team behind the 2009 reboot of Friday the 13th needed to create the same level of terror as the original film, but also by including a fresh spin on the story. Speaking about an early instruction he received when he joined the project, director Marcus Nispel said, Create an underground, something claustrophobic, an old mine shaft, something like that, and have the characters operate from there. The tunnels get the job done, enhancing the underlying eeriness of the story. The narrow passageways add an unsettling element to the aesthetic, even if their effect is subconscious. The audience feels the tension the tunnels create, even if they're not aware that that feeling is the tunnels doing. In real life, though, the underground labyrinth wasn't in close quarters after all. Set builders followed Nispel's wishes of creating claustrophobic pathways, but if the camera were to back up, the viewer would realize the tunnels existed in a large soundstage. Still, that doesn't take away from how terrifying it is. Jason! Say hi to mommy! In 2000, Warner Brothers re-released 1973's The Exorcist with expanded sequences and unused scenes that landed on the cutting room floor in the horror film's initial run. Branded as The Exorcist, the version you've never seen, the extended movie included a moment in which Reagan spider walked backward down the staircase. While Reagan is portrayed in most of the movie by Linda Blair, she is substituted by stunt double Ann Miles for this scene. Back in the 70s, even with Miles' talented contortionist skills, she still required wires attached to her body to pull off the movement. Despite the filmmaker's best efforts, those cables were too visible on camera. They distracted from the action and dispelled the illusion. So, director William Friedkin removed the scene from the film's original debut. By 2000, though, technology had advanced leaps and bounds. Making the wires invisible by means of CGI was more than doable. As a result, Friedkin reinstated the spider walk scene into the version you've never seen. This trend fell in line with several other 70s and 80s classics re-released with updated technology around the dawn of the new millennium. George Lucas famously added CGI to the original Star Wars trilogy for its 1997 theatrical re-release, while Steven Spielberg similarly edited shots for the 20th anniversary of E.T. The Extraterrestrial in 2002. From the director's chair of 1975's Jaws, a young Steven Spielberg delighted audiences just as much with what he didn't show on camera as what he did. The shark's elusive absence throughout most of the film is just as strong a horror device, if not stronger, than featuring the beast front and center in every scene. The restraint in the shark's appearances consequently meant that any time Spielberg chose to spotlight a physical shark figure, the impact upon the audience was more menacing. In a way, the completed version of Jaws is basically already without special effects, because Spielberg and his crew frequently couldn't use the special effect they planned for. The shark doesn't seem quite as scary when he's on shore. Separate versions of him were fabricated to only be shown on screen from one side. This meant the opposite side of the shark's body essentially provided a peek inside the robot's organs, which made it more fascinating than frightening. Bob Maddy designed the shark, coming out of retirement at the request of production designer Joe Alves. Though the shark didn't chew up as much of the movie's runtime as it could, its brief screen time does a lot with a little. That's great! That's just great! A key ingredient in 1981's An American Werewolf in London is, well, the American Werewolf in London. Creating the film's star character was a tall order tasked to makeup artist Rick Baker. In a home video bonus feature, Baker explained the process began as a creative conflict between himself and director John Landis. Baker wanted the werewolf to walk upright on two feet. Landis preferred the creature to walk four-legged. Baker said he kept saying he wanted it to be this demon hound from hell. This mandate would be harder to pull off on screen. Baker wondered how they would be able to pull this off, since putting two people in a suit might look too strange. The solution came to Baker in the middle of the night. He thought back to childhood wheelbarrow races, and how he could implement it here. Could a similar contortion of performers serve as a makeshift werewolf? Turns out, yes. Whenever the wolf performer suited up, they used their arms as the wolf's front limbs, while the rest of their body lay parallel to the ground on a plank within the suit, and their feet unceremoniously stuck out of the wolf's behind. The back of the suit emulated a wheelbarrow, able to be moved about by another person from behind. As the wolf walked, a puppeteer followed, operating the creature's hind legs with rods. Thus, a werewolf was born on screen. In the early days of filmmaking, artists' resources for creating movie magic were much more limited than today's supply of hat tricks. However, this fact doesn't render their work unimpressive. On the contrary, the wizardry that these creatives achieved nearly a century ago is all the more astonishing given the constant need to innovate in areas where no prior technology existed. For example, in 1933's King Kong, the giant gorilla is seen on a Broadway stage before a gathered audience. In real life, filmmakers captured this shot in two places. Inside the Shrine Theater in Los Angeles, the crew filmed a wide shot of an empty stage, void of any monster. 
Separately, stop-motion animators filmed the model of Kong on a miniature stage, to be supersized and imposed into the finished shot through a process known as matting. It's natural for modern audiences accustomed to the special effects spectacles of Marvel films to watch King Kong and wonder how audiences of 1933 considered this type of effect impressive at all. No one would blame them, since by today's standards, Kong's appearance looks incredibly dated. Not that moviegoers of the era believed they were seeing footage of an actual giant gorilla, but the illusion and wonder of watching the scene in action still captivated them.